All right, hey guys, let's continue with our reading of Slopes of War. Um, I need to show you guys something though. So hold on one second. Okay. So we need to go over a couple things before we start because some of you guys are getting really confused about the homework. So, okay. This is what our Google Classroom should look like. Well, except for you're probably in a different period if you're not in my first period. Okay, it says week three and four. So the slopes of war is going to take us all of this week and all of next week. So make sure you're in the classwork tab on the stream. I did give you guys a little bit of information because some people are getting really confused. Um, so let's just kind of oops, go over some of that. So, okay, you have the slideshow, which I'll show you in a second, that tells you what we're doing. I assigned the slopes of war reflection for all of you guys, and then I've been posting for each chapter. So let me show you what it looks like. Okay, so I modified this a little to help you guys because people are getting really confused. Okay, each section is a different group of chapters. So the before section was that first video I made, so you were just supposed to do a reflection there. July 1st is the next video. The video we're doing today is July 2nd. It's called that. I'm aware that today is not July 1st or 2nd or what have you. Um, it's called that because the battle lasted from July 1st to July 3rd. So um, all I want right here is just your guys' opinions, just, just your reflection. So that's, that's what's happening right there, okay? And then you guys obviously have figured out how to get to the chapters. Um, if you are listening to this and you'd wanted to read the book yourself, I did post for you in our explanation of what we're doing every day, um, a link to the, um, to the folder that has all of the different um, chapters. So you can open it if you don't wanna be Having to listen to me read it, you can, oh, it's not doing it right now. Oh, there you go. You could be actually reading the chapters. So um, I just want to make sure you guys know all that because I'm getting a lot of emails where you guys seem to be really confused about it. So um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to help you out there. Let's close out of all of these and then we can actually get to reading. Woohoo! Okay. All right. So, so far, um, the battle started, right? Um, we're on chapter 12. We're going to be reading chapter 12. Um, we ended with that weird scene with Becca and Curtis. Oh, so I guess the battle actually hasn't started quite yet. Um, Curtis snuck off to go make out with Becca. Super awkward. That's okay. That's not okay, but whatever. It's a different time. Um, so that is where we are at. So we're in, okay. So let's see. I think everybody is still alive so far. Tully's having that whole issue where he's haunted by the hand. Buck is trying to help him. Becca has a thing for Curtis. Uh, Leander. Um, it's just kind of stoked on war. Um, let's see, have we talked about anything else? Both the two groups, like the Confederates and the Union, are kind of um, passing by each other. And we know that obviously the Battle of Gettysburg is about to happen. So um, I just wanted to go over this again because a lot of you guys seem really confused. So the Battle of Gettysburg was fought from July 1st to the 3rd in 1863. And it was in the town of Gettysburg, which right, we didn't expect to really be a battle, or any of the people who lived there didn't really. Um, it's between the Union, which is in the north, and the Confederates in the south. It's part of the American Civil War. Oopsie, it's not what I was trying to do. Okay. Um, it involved the largest number of casualties of the entire war and is often described as the war's turning point, as well as the bloodiest battle of the war. So there is the bloodiest single day battle, which would be Antietam, um, but Gettysburg being a three day battle, 
Um, it was, and just because of the way the ground was and everything, which we'll learn about today, um, ends up being just a massacre. Um, and in the end, there was about 23 to 28,000 total casualties. Um, 3,155 soldiers were killed, 14,529 were wounded. 5,365 were captured or missing, and up to 4,951 died from injuries sustained as a result of the battle, or they were um, civilian casualties. So, um, yeah, obviously war has a lot more effects, and um, when we count the casualties of an actual battle, we don't always include the people who maybe didn't die at the battle, but died as a result of the battle. So... Um, yeah, a lot of limbs. A lot of limbs were cut off. Um, and so I just want to warn you guys that this one does get a little gruesome. There's a scene in a field hospital. So if you were grossed out by that one guy getting the bullet taken out of his arm, oh, oh boy, just you wait. It's about to get a lot grosser. So enjoy. All right, chapter 12. It was after midnight when Meade arrived from Tannytown. Hancock, the commander of the Second Corps, had recommended that the army make a stand along the fish hook of land south of Gettysburg, and Meade, inspecting the line during the bright moonlight hours before dawn, agreed. By morning, most of the men would be up, except for Sedwick's Sixth Corps, now embarked on a 36-mile march. It would probably not arrive much sooner than midday, but when it did, about 90,000 men would be in place. At dawn, the general, with field glasses skewed to his eyes, was even more satisfied by what he saw. Ahead of him, a vast battlefield floated up out of the morning fog. Orchards and cultivated fields, neat fences, a few small farmhouses. Now he could clearly see the advantages of their position. The federal line was more elevated. His artillery would have more range and power, and it would be easier for him to move segments of the army back and forth than it would be for Lee, whose troops would be stretched thinner and farther than his own. Coffee, sir. A wan aide with drooping eyes offered him a metal cup and dared to suggest, you really ought to try and get some sleep. Get some yourself if you need it. The aide withdrew, hurt that his intentions had been misunderstood. He thought how rumpled and haggard the general looked how irritable and fussy and hot-tempered the man could be. He decided against suggesting a wash and a change of clothes at headquarters. Obviously, the commander of the Union Army had more important matters on his mind. Revived by the cool morning air, Meade gulped the hot, sweet coffee and continued his survey. The fishhook image, which had snagged his inner vision in the night, was now exposed in the early light. The tip of the hook at Culp's Hill was occupied by Sulcum's men, with the remnants of the first corps strung out along the low saddle of land that joined Culp's Hill to Cemetery Hill. Here, what was left of Howard's battered 11 was protected by a heavy crescent of artillery. Then the hook bent, the shank running out along the ridge, with Hancock's reliable second corps in position and linking with Sickles' third, which extended out in the direction of the two wooded knolls that anchored the extreme left. It crossed Meade's mind that if Lee managed to slide men in around the round top and come in on the rear, it would be a serious problem. Sickles posted at a vulnerable spot must be trusted to prevent this from happening. Too bad he didn't think much of Dan Sickles. The man was a murderer and a politician, a deadly combination, and Meade intended to keep a close eye on him. Soldiers were storing, stirring, yawning, and rising, going about their early morning duties. Meade didn't notice them glancing at him out of the corners of their eyes. His mind was preoccupied. But as the smell of frying salt pork drifted greasily through the air, he thought for the first time in hours of food. Private Charlie Payne, carrying water back to his company, watched the new commander walk briskly toward the Union headquarters in the tiny leisure farmhouse beyond the ridge. George! His friend lurched ahead, water splashing from two heavy pails. Did you see him? See who? Dawson stumbled, spilled more water, swore. General Meade. I didn't notice. Wasn't much to notice, Charlie grumbled. He was disappointed. At least McClellan and Burnsides and Fighting Joe Hooker had looked like men in charge. This one with his wrinkled neck and cranky eyes. Charlie had, a smile, had to smile a little. Looked more like a snapping turtle about to bite down hard. 
At dawn, Buck roused from a dark, safe cave of sleep in order to move. The men, who had marched 25 miles on the previous day, were thick-footed, half-dreaming. Sometimes, when they halted for one reason or another, the soldiers would sink into the deep, wet grass beside the road and nod off again, until some angry, shouted officer on horseback would crash through the fog and prod the groggy, groggy men back to their feet. Do you know where we are, Tully? Even in a place filmed with mist, Buck was sure of himself. We're coming up behind Cemetery Ridge. Tully plodded ahead, his eyes remote, and Buck thought, I've brought him this far, just a little way to go. The morning sun glided up a pale blue summer sky, pulled off the last of the milky vapor and revealed the land. Buck felt a happy leap of pride. Wheat and cornfields, the contour and texture of the meadows, bright with wildflowers, shining wings careened overhead, and he recognized the pattern of each flight, each individual bird song. Hell, oh, this ain't no day to fight, Jesse Flynn said. This here's a strawberry social sort of day, a day for lemonade. Why don't you enter why don't you mention it to General Meade? Buck suggested with a slow smile. See if he'll rearrange his plans. Maybe we'll celebrate the 4th of July here, Jesse said. Maybe you'll introduce me to that pretty girl you carry around in your knapsack. Buck wished he hadn't shown the Dangereros type of Becca. He hated it when the soldiers asked to see it, sat staring at it, touching it with his thick, dirty fingers. That girl's too young to care about anything about men, he said. How old is she? Not 16 yet. My sister was married and had a baby in her lap before she was 16, Jesse said. It disgusted Buck to think of such a thing. Becca was a child. Last time he had seen her, she'd been hanging upended from a branch, the ruffles of her petticoat cascading as she swung by her knees, grinning at him upside down, her big dark eyes like polka dots. Hundreds of soldiers were massed behind their artillery parked ahead of them, with hundreds more pressing in from behind. Where do, you suppose the, where do you suppose them rebels are? Flynn wanted to know. Over on the other ridge, Buck, who always kept his ears open for useful information, had heard the officers talking near the Lutheran Seminary. That don't sound fair. That means they got the Lord on their side this time. Buck was glad that the Army of Northern Virginia was faceless, out of sight. It was easier to hate men you couldn't see. When a rebel picket hollered, Why don't you uns come over and fight we uns? We want your two. It was easy to believe he was meaner and more ignorant than the northern man, and yet Buck knew that that really wasn't true. Often there was joking and friendly conversation. Once on duty on the Rapson Hog, he had sent newspapers skidding across the water on a little raft in exchange for some mellow Virginia tobacco. After dark, some of his company had swum across and played cards with the southern men. Curse and Mason could be somewhere nearby. They had all wrestled together as youngsters, laughing and panting and sometimes crying with rage as they tried to pin each other to the ground, but he could never think of either of them as his enemy. George were always circulating in the army of fathers against sons, brothers against brothers, kin meeting kin in battle, or men from the same family enlisting together, fighting and dying together. He hoped he would never see his cousins on the field. He chewed hard crackers as the troops waited for the 6th Corps to arrive and made sure Tully put some into his belly too, though he knew his friend didn't care much about eating anymore. Again, the 5th Corps was ordered to move. This time, Sky's men halted at a stream near a mill. Buck said, we used to come here a long time ago, remember? Tully stared at the green-white water spinning over the revolving steps of the wheel. It seems to fascinate him as it had when he was a boy. They were formed in columns by division in order to rest. There was the sound of skirmishing in the distance. Soon they would be part of the thing they had pushed so hard to reach. It was time to think of what lay ahead. Jesse said hoarsely, I've done bad things, Buck. You know I have. He reached into his pocket and took out a tattered pack of playing cards. Do you want these? Buck shook his head. Throw them away if it will make you feel better. Flynn sat, clutching the cards to his chest, trying to make up his mind. Gambling was sinful, and if a man was killed, he wouldn't want the evidence on him when he reached the heavenly gates. Yet, these were lucky cards, carefully marked. Finally, he stuffed them back into his pocket. Nearby, a chaplain was conducting a service for a huddle of solemn men, their voices a monotone of prayer. Buck pulled his own testament out of his uniform. His mother had made him memorize verses from it when he was a boy. 
It was at times like this that most men looked for comfort, for small, hopeful signs. He let the book flop open, then he looked down and read some of the tiny printed words. The Lord, the Lord shall preserve thee from evil. Ye shall preserve thy soul. Even though he wasn't superstitious, he could not help feeling cheered. Tully sat staring at his hands, knotted tensely together, and Buck wondered if he was thinking of Manassas, the skeleton finger pointing. All right, chapter 13. General Lee had hoped to take Culp's Hill first thing in the morning, but at dawn, when it was discovered to be occupied by Union troops, it seemed wiser to hit both enemy flanks at the same time and as soon as possible. A.P. Hill's men tried from their work on the previous day, sorry, tired from their work on the previous day, but concentrate on the center of the line. Yet nothing went according to plan, and as the bright morning dwindled away into the soft, warm core of afternoon, only two of Longstreet's divisions were in place. I never like to go into battle with one boot off, old Pete said as he sat and idly whittled, waiting for the third division to arrive. Some of the high-ranking officers murmured that he might be stalling because he was so stubbornly opposed to Lee's strategy. But in the meantime, the infantry found it pleasant to rest and smoke. Reckon it's worth a fight now and then just to get a belly full, a private gulping down the last of the hard tack and salt pork he had robbed from the haversack of a dead Union soldier, sighed with satisfaction. Then, reaching into the bowl of his hat, he dropped ripe, cher ripe cherries one by one into his open mouth. At three o'clock, word came that Pickett would be delayed until the following day. One boot on or not, Longstreet knew he must go into battle with the men he had on hand. A mile away on Cemetery Ridge, General Daniel Sickles had come to pester his superior, George Meade, and to explain how unhappy he was with the placement of his third corps out by the round top. My orders were clear, weren't they? Irritable from his sleepless night, Meade peered at the officer, whom he neither liked nor respected, with popping bloodshot eyes. We need you there. The position is too flat, Sickle was intent. The artillery is massed by the woods and we can't see a damned thing. Just ahead, however, about a half mile west along the Emmitsburg Road at the Peach Orchard, the land was slightly elevated. All Sickles wanted was permission to remove his men from where they were and put them on the higher ground where they ought to be before the enemy got there first. Meade was annoyed. He was too busy to check the situation for himself and yet he wasn't willing to trust the judgment of a man who wasn't even an army regular, a man who had won his stars through political connections. Sickles was tarnished, notorious, undisciplined. He'd been a congressman before the war, but had been cut from Washington social circles, social circles when he had shot his wife's lover, Biden Keyes, the grandson of the man who had composed the national anthem. Sickle had pleaded temporary insanity and been acquitted, but some people felt that even worse than the murder was Sickle's shocking lack of taste in taking his wife back. Anxious to get him out of the way, Meade hailed Henry Hunt, his chief of artillery, who was passing by on a hurried mission of his own. Go and see what he's talking about and report back to me. A short time later, when he had looked the situation over, Hunt told Sickles that he could see what he wanted to do and why. But if you move the corps out to the Emmitsburg Road, you're going to leave a gap back here that will have to be plugged with some of the reserves. So it's not up to me to make that kind of decision. You can at least recommend it, can't you? The general tugged at the collar of his uniform with quick, sharp jerks. I've already sent Brennan out there with his sharpshooters, and they ran into rows of rebels getting ready to move in on my left. If we stay here, we're sitting ducks. Hunt wished that the excited man would calm down, that the matter was settled. He was anxious to get back to his artillery. Look, I'll talk to General Meade and get back to you as soon as I can. All day, the Union troops massed along the shank of land south of town, had witnessed in hot sunshine from something to, had waited in hot sunshine for something to happen. Around noon, there had been a brief fierce fury of firing off near Seminary Ridge, and reports had come back that Benin's men had uncovered a suspicious movement there, but except for light skirmishing and an occasional thump of artillery, nothing much had happened since. Then, mid-afternoon, the bright, clear sound of trumpets lifted in there. Take a look over there, Charlie Payne leaped to the top of the low stone wall ahead of him and pointed to the slope that flattened out towards the round tops. There goes the third corps. Now where do you suppose it's going to? From their position along the ridge, the men of the second corps could hear faint shouts, 
see skirmishes lightly feeling the advance as thousands in battle formation swept forward, four strong guns and caissons bumping after in the rear. I reckon they've just gone down to pick some peaches. Unlike Charlie, who was high, strung, and excitable, George Dawson was easy and relaxed. But hell, peaches ain't even ripe yet. A lieutenant laughed and spat tobacco juice on the ground. Neither is Sickles. Soldiers were being aligned along the dusty em Emmitsburg Road, sent into Sheriff's Orchard, and angled into the vicinity of Devil's Den. Charlie thought there was something grand and powerful about the spectacle of 10,000 infantrymen, strokes of blue planted along leaf green and white yellow, bayonets sharp as needles piercing the golden afternoon. He'd done it perfect, didn't he? George had a slow, kind face and round, sleepy eyes. He took off his forge cap and scratched his dirty, ragged curls. Except for one little thing, he gestured in the direction of the rock-strewn area that lay beneath the anchoring hills. Looks to me as if Sickles has run out of men. From their elevated position, they could see the obvious flaw in the, op in the operation. Maybe they'll send in some of the reserves, Charlie said, hopefully. They'd better hurry then if they're thinking of it, the lieutenant said. Now I don't believe there's anyone up there either. He blinked, straining to catch a glimpse of Union guns on Little Round Top. Signal officers, Charlie had glimpsed a wagging of flags near the summit of the hill. Better be more in signal officers, George said. Those rebels crawl up there. Why, they'll nail this whole line shut tighter in a coffin lid. His, his men had barely been smothered into place when Sickles received an order to attend the Council of War. He sent his excuses off to me, but another messenger galloped, galloped back almost immediately with a demand that he come at once. The officer fumed. Enemy guns were warming up already, and it seemed ridiculous that he must obey at such a time. As he reached headquarters, a noisy din was rising in the southwest, and smoke was popping upward into the cloudless sky. Don't bother, Meade stood in the doorway of the leisure house, angrily flapping his hands, telling him not to get off his horse. Sickles thought that he looked like a flustered housewife shooing geese. I'm coming with you. Together, they galloped back in along the slope. Enemy artillery was pounding in, and Meade saw thick gray waves of infantry cresting Seminary Ridge, spilling down into the woods southwest of the peach orchard. He was astounded. The Third Corps was now open to attack on three sides. The whole federal line was threatened, and his sturdy defense, Fishhook, had been snapped. Now you can see what I meant by superior ground, Sickles, with thousands of good men in danger, was quite unaware of what he had done. A shell exploded in the road ahead of them. Meade's horse, Old Baldy, shuddered in fright. With his popping eyes and pursed lips, the general looked as if he might explode himself. Sickles said hastily, of course, if you object to the new disposition, Meade wheeled toward him, his sallow face com convulsed with molted color. I do object, sir, vehemently. Both your flanks are in the air. You have broken our line of defense. Another shell screeched past and burst. Old Baldy reared in terror, and the general struggled to control him. Then we'll return to the old position at once, Sickle said sulkily, if that's what you have to side in. It's too late, general. The enemy has decided for us. Meade started away, calling back, you must do what you can. I'll send you support. It had seemed to Sickles that things had gone so smoothly and so well, and now he saw his plan had tugged loose like a sheet in the wind and was sailing out of control. Nick Laws, steady and reliable, had gone about the business of shaking men from his division out along the ridge, but John Hood, who had reconnoitred on his own, sent a staff officer to General Longstreet with a bright suggestion. His Texas scouts had run into an advance line of battle near an orchard, seen the main line of the enemy massed heavily along the opposite ridge and discovered the stony land that lay in front of the two rocky hills was a formidable barrier. How much simpler it would be, he suggested, to slide eastward, circle the knolls, and move in on the federal rear where the army trains and artillery were parked, exposed and vulnerable to attack. What Hood wanted to do was exactly what Longstreet had already tried out, of, had tried out on Lee and he had had his answer to that more than once. Longstreet's reply was, General Lee's orders are to attack up the Emmitsburg Road. It was the first, the only time in Hood's career that he had ever balked at getting into battle. He tried to make his objections even clearer by sending another officer to Longstreet. The answer was brief. 
General Lee's orders are to attack up the Emmitsburg's road. Hood's third message invited his superior to come and look the situation over for himself. General Lee's orders are to attack up the Emmitsburg road. All right then, frustrated, Hood stared across the valley. Timber had been cut, exposing the western slope of the smaller hill, and he was almost certain there was no Union soldiers there yet. He was sure he could guide his men around successfully and pounce on the rear of the enemy without too much risk. Yet he also knew it would be easier to move those little mountains than to persuade old Pete to change his mind. Longstreet had arrived on horseback, cool professional, their eyes met briefly. Generally isn't feeling well today, a touch of the old soldier's disease. Hood sensed that Longstreet was giving him this information as some sort of explanation. You know we must obey his orders. Hood nodded. Reluctantly, he gave the command. Men advanced to the lip of the ridge and poured down into the sunlit valley. Twenty, minute, twenty minutes later, the general was carried from the field with a paralyzing arm wound and bitter regrets that would last him his lifetime. Sixty Confederate guns had opened fire, followed by a hard, driving infantry attack. In the new position, the third, the third Corps was overwhelmed by a, a vicious assault as shot and shell ripped through the tidy rows of the peach orchard, knocking off branches, shredding men to pieces. The battle had become a wind-whipped fire that raged this way and that, leaping fences flicking about a, around a farmhouse and its outbuildings, dying away and flashing back to blazing life as ground was won and lost and won again. We ought to be down there, Private George Dawson looked down calmly as bits of blue and dung-colored drabs kneeling and firing, running from tree to tree in a thickening haze. Smoke swelled and billowed skyward, shifting at times to reveal splintered caissons, torn and dying horses struggling on the ground, crippled soldiers hobbling out along the road. Hancock should send us to, in to help. It's their fight now, Charlie Penn was Payne was relieved that he was high on the ridge behind the sheltering stone wall. But if they give a but if they give way, it'll be our fight too. He prayed for Sickles' men to hang on. Far below, hundreds plunged into a wheat field, senses flayed open, blood pumping, sweat pouring down their powder blackened faces, their breath whining hard and fast through mouths and noses, mini balls spangled and hummed among running split spinning. Oh my gosh. Many balls spanged and hummed along running, spinning, falling shapes. Crouching men groped for cartridges, torn the paper twists with their teeth, mechanically performed the 10 separate motions necessary to, re to reload the heated guns. A Union private absently slapped his chest, saw blood gush out between his fingers, wondered if death could be such a tiny sting, and toppled sideways. An artilleryman saw his boot lay yards away, discovered that his foot was in it. Quick, over here, wounded. Dan Sickles called for help. Get something to tie this thing up before I bleed to death. He was carried off the field, a cigar clamped hard between his teeth. Half an hour later, his shattered leg had been removed. Chapter 14. G.K. Warren, chief engineer of the Union Army, had been sent by me to investigate the left. From the summit of Little Round Top, he looked down into a smashed orchard and the smoking whirlpool of a wheat field. Shouts rose and faint, defiant yells. He heard the crackle of muskets, the boom and thud of artillery. Sickles' salient had been hit hard on three sides and was badly damaged, and Warren did not see how it could hold on the out much longer. He saw something else that alarmed him. Quick, gray-brown shapes were gliding into the jagged wasteland near the bottom of the hill, taking shelter behind immense lopsided boulders, squeezing into the cracks and crannies of Devil's Den. Rebel sharpshooters, the enemy had already overlapped Sickles' crumbling flank and was sweeping ahead in Warren's direction. Big Round Top, farther to the south, was higher, but so densely wooded that it would be almost impossible to get art artillery up there. This was the vital spot then. Little Round Top was the key to the field, and for some unfathomable reason, it was completely undefended. Except for a signal officer hastily packing up to leave, Engineer was alone on the hill. If the Confederates got there and managed to get their guns to the top, they would be able to enfilade the whole Union line. The battle would be over. Don't go, he shouted to the signal officer. Keep waving those flags. Let them think there's somebody up here. The man nodded and began to jerk the flags back and forth. 
Flushed with heat and a terrible anxiety, Orrin picked his way down the hill, loose pebbles scattering from under his horse's hooves. Emerging from the brush at the bottom of the hill, he galloped off to look for help. He was in luck. He ran into Vincent's brigade, quick stepping along the road toward the wheat field, and managed to divert it. Men were sent scrambling up the steep face of Little Round Top. A battery of artillery followed, the gun crew grunting and straining as they dragged and pushed the heavy weapons up over the rocks. We could find our way up here blindfolded, couldn't we, Tull? Smoky sunlight drifted down through the treetops, splattering across the lichen-crusted boulders. The sound of the battle behind the hill was blurred. Buck grabbed a scrub oak and pulled himself higher, exhilarated to be in a place he knew so well. Below him, Tully climbed slowly, his face hidden by the peak of his forage cap. Buck wanted to grab him, shake him, force him to hurry. Instead, he paused to catch his breath and said, Curtis and Becca and I camped out here one night. It seemed a very long time ago. He remembered the black sky, crowded with stars, curving over him, and how he had felt his life waited for him beyond the darkness, a distant adventure as mysterious and remote as the long streaks of light falling overhead, dying in the summer or night. They'd reached the top. To his right, through a screen of pine branches, Buck caught his first glimpse of Gettysburg. How close it was, only a battle span away. To the west, he heard the sharp metallic crack of rifle fire, the moan of missiles gliding in through the mangled branches of Scherfsey's peach orchard below, where he and the town boys had been drawn like flies each year when the fruit was ripe. Bodies like torn rags were draped beneath the damaged trees, hung over fence rails scattered about along the Emmitsburg Road. Shells burst violently across a smudged wheat field, dirty smoke masking the shapes of running men, the blunt, brutal noises of cannons. On the right, by file, into line. Urgently, Colonel Strong Vincent lapped his four regiments into a quarter circle around the southwest shoulder of the hill. This is the end of the line, he called to Chamberlain, commander of the 20th Maine. You understand? You must hold this ground at all cost. Chamberlain nodded. His unit, hunched well below the crest, had only a few spare oaks in front of it, too small to offer much protection, and his men were busily making breastworks out of logs and fallen branches, taking shelter at all cost. Buck felt a queer shock. He opened his canteen, gulped the warm water. 80, maybe 90,000 men stretched in a wide blue band all the way to Culp's Hill, two or three miles away. And yet, here on the summit of a little round top, almost by accident, one brigade was holding down the entire line. The place should have been defended like a fortress, buckled around with iron, bristling with big guns. But instead, there's only us, he thought. One battery of artillery. If they let go, then the whole weight of the Union Army might topple over in one devastating landslide. He didn't want to think about that. Buck licked his dry lips, feeling thirsty again. Around him, soldiers were digging in, ducking behind rocks and trees. His regiment was linked to the main men at the far left, with the New Yorkers scuttling into position to the right. A lucky sign. The 44th was their regimental twin. They had fought side by side with them in every battle. Where the hill curved around to the north, Michiganers gazed across Plum Run into a stretch of stony rubble where many balls were already ricocheting in among the rocks. Tully. He stood, rifle dangling, staring off into the distance, that familiar absence in his face, as if he had sidestepped out of time and was back in some friendly zone of childhood. He had played on this hill when he was a boy, rolled down these slopes, pretending to be dead, sprung back to life with a laugh. Buck saw that Tull wasn't going to fight, knowing it filled him with a helpless anger. Earlier, they had been read an order handed down from General Meade. Corps and other commanders are authorized to order instant death to any soldier who fails to do his duty at this hour. His friend hadn't listened, didn't care. Why did he always have to be responsible, especially now that his own life's in danger? He grabbed the other musket, loaded it, rammed the Enfield hard against Tully's chest. When they get here, don't bet, or sorry, when they get here, you better shoot, damn you, he hissed. You hear me? You shoot. Ahead down the hillside was a, right, was a wide granite slab, creased in the top, bushes thick and springy around its base. Buck pushed Tully toward it and showed him and shoved him down. There was no resistance. It was a straw man that he pressed flat against the stone. 
You stay there, his voice was hoarse with strain, and don't move. He knew he wasn't getting through. Tully just wasn't going to let himself be there. Buck hunkered, sweats rolling down his face, stinging his eyes, soaking through the heavy wool of his uniform. He said quietly, listen, if you can't do it, if you can't shoot, then play dead. He waited, wanting to make sure that he was understood. When they get here, you just play dead, Tull, the way we used to, remember? We'll try and cover you. Up the hill, not far away, he found a stump, thick and wide and rotten, ants flowing in and out. A short distance behind him, Jesse Flynn was crouching behind a rock. I keep thinking of lemonade, he said, ice cold lemonade. When it's over, Buck said, maybe we can go home and Beck can fix us some. With the rinds floating in it? That's how she makes it. Flynn smiled, wiping his forehead with his sleeve. I look forward to it, he winked, hand to meeting her. There was the leaden thug of muskets being loaded along the line, the clash and clang of rammers. Buck reached for a cartridge, ripped off the paper with his teeth. A soldier ought to have good, good front teeth, but he'd seen some with poor ones or none at all and wondered how they stayed alive. Once in battle on the peninsula, He'd been too excited and kept on loading the musket, jamming the muzzle, and forgetting to fire. How dumb and green he'd been in those days. Morrill's company dropped down the slope, men moving warily, rifles held high as the skirmishers disappeared among the foil foil foliage at the bottom of the hill. Buck tucked himself in small behind the stump, feeling the tension crackling among the soldiers waiting near the top. Minutes later, a high, wild scream rose from the valley to the south. About a quarter of a mile away, three lines of enemy troops were plunging forward, sunlight glancing off their bayonets. Come to the ready, take aim. Men in sun-bleached gray and yellow-brown swept in closer. Then they were rising up the hill, growing fierce faces and terrible eyes and wide open yelling mouths that trailed the high-pitched rebel yet wail. Indians, Buck thought, that's where they get it from. He and his friends had made the same sound as boys, whapping their hands across their lips. He waited, coolly chose, aimed, and fired, watched a long body dance through space and crash, dirt colored on the ground. His eyes flicked to Tully, curled motionless behind the rock. Stay there, don't move. With furious rhythm, Buck knelt, reloaded, aimed low and fired again as hundreds of bodies lapped upward in a thick rising tide. Buck thought, outnumbered, so few of us and all of them. Many balls slashed through the branches, riddled tree trunks sizzled against stone, and then Union canisters was ripping into the advance, whirling iron balls spraying the enemy like a deadly hail, tearing huge holes in the ranks. Men from Texas and Alabama were going down, but others were pushing up from behind, desperation a hot driving force. If they reach here, they've got us, they've won. Buck ripped paper vi vi viciously, jammed in a cartridge, sensed a sudden wavering hesitation below and saw the wave break at last, curling back and ebbing swiftly down the slope, leaving dozens of bodies bleached against the hillside, some limp, some rolling and twisting in their pain. Jesse Flynn fired steadily into the retreating mass, cursing his voice high and shrill. They're going, going. They'll be back, Buck muttered. They always came back. Quickly, he glanced around. Men from the ambulance corps were dragging the wounded to the rear. An excited drummer boy, no more than 14 or 15, had wriggled into a place along the line and was loading a rifle. A musician snatched up a musket from a fallen man. A color bearer jammed a staff into a crevice in the rock and freed his hands to fire. Colonel Vincent, dark and erect, stood high on a boulder, shouting orders, but Buck couldn't hear him above the uproar. Flynn shrieked, here they come, here they come. There was a long, timeless interval as a fresh assault screamed up the hillside, fell back, climbed higher, clawed closer to the top. Jesse Flynn sucked in breath, pitched headlong, flopped once, and lay still with open, staring eyes. A running figure leaped through the haze of smoke, saw Tully, raised a bayonet, buck fired, the rebel toppled, a sprawled hand dripping red across the body, curled against the rock. Once again, swift, darting forms were slipping back, dropping back. Buck watched through an eerie reddish glow, wondered if something had broken in his head, if his brain were filling up with blood. Energy was leaking out along the line, the men gasping and grunting with exhaustion. 
His fingers fumbled thickly as he reached for ammunition. Sixty rounds at the start, and now he was almost out. Something odd was happening below. He glimpsed an ending column drifting away to the left, and then lost it beneath the trees. Why over there? No time to think. He needed cartridges. On his belly, Buck twisted down across the scattered trail of body of bloodied playing cards towards a dead body. A bad hand for Jesse Flynn. He didn't look into his face. The cartridge box was warm and sticky. Buck took what there was, shimmied back to his shelter behind the rotten stump. A curious maneuver was taking place among the men from Maine. Swiftly, in one fluid motion, Chamberlain had bent back his left into a right angle to form a solid line. Soldiers were scrambling to hide themselves among the rocks and underbrush as the right dodged and shifted sideways, hurrying to form a single rank that would cover the original front. Quick, this way, hurry, over here. Now the 83rd was being moved, sent sliding over to help fill in the gaps. The gray column that had disappeared under the trees climbed the hill without being seen, then expected to, fa to fall in on unguarded left. Now, as the Alabamans charged out of hiding into the open, they met a fierce blast of resistance from Chamberlain's concealed, bent back wing. With a roar, the two forces smashed head on, grappling in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Men who had been lumberjacks swung their muskets like axes, slashing and chopping, bodies rolled over and over on the ground, furiously clenched, beating at each other with guns, fists, rocks, growling and snarling like dogs. Charges, countercharges, furious bursts of action brawled up and down the slope in a reverberating, inhuman clash of sound. Quick, I need a cartridge, a soldier shouted to Buck. Can't, I'm out. Ammunition, ammunition. There was an angry, rising buzz all along the line as men groped among the fallen bodies in a frantic search. For Buck, it was the most bitter movement he had, moment he had ever experienced in battle. They had hung on, the frail fence of the brigade had held out the enemy, and at the critical moment, there was nothing left to fight with. The next attack would crash over them, beginning the fatal downhill plunge that would sweep away the war. Fix bayonets, Chamberlain's order shocked his men, silenced them. There was a blankness on their blackened faces and incomprehension. Then, with a keen metallic rustling, they obeyed. The colors rose. Charge bayonets! Charge! A lieutenant leaped forward, followed by the color sec sergeant. Come on, boys! Incredulous, Buck watched the main regiment knife downhill in a great swinging thrust. Below, faces gaped upward, astonished, frozen into shapes of fear at the, as the movement gained momentum, cut closer in a broad, glistening, scythe-like stroke. Then the rebels were turning, flying in panic, throwing away their weapons as they ran. Look! Oh, look at them! I've never seen them skedaddle before, crooned a happy voice behind Buck. They're running just like rabbits. Oh, that's a pretty sight. Far below, gunfire sliced in ob obliquely from the left. Buck saw a row of muskets spaced along a low wall beneath the trees. He remembered moral skirmishers who had disappeared at the beginning of the fight. They couldn't get back here, must have been hiding there all the time. Their chance now. Buck took a quick glance around. Blood splashed everywhere, puddles of it gleaming among the rocks. Colonel Vincent down, dozens of officers down, hundreds of men lying soaked and limp everywhere he looked. The cost had been terrible, but they had held little round top, fastened down the drifting Union line. He had known they were good fighters all along, and given a chance, they had proved it. Soldiers were coming out from their shelters, running downhill, eager to get in on the route. Prisoners, let's get some prisoners. Then Buck was running too, shouting with joy, ignoring the sporadic fire still, still spattering the fit fully from the right. Something exploded viciously into his lower leg. The impact knocked him over, sent him rolling in the door, tore out his breath, floated him off into a calm of black. Chapter 15. I'm going to warn you right now, this one gets a little gruesome. So be prepared for that. West Culp checked his ammunition and rubbed the stock of his gun with his sleeve. He was proud of his rifle, cut down to fit his size. His name was carved on it. Cause you look too happy to be sane. You think I'm happy about going up there? Curtis glanced briefly at Culp's hill. Well, I'm not. I never like looking up when I have to fight. That's what's wrong with this battle, Wes. For some reason, we've got the wrong angle on it this time. 
Usually we've got the blue bellies squinting up at us. Soldiers were stamping out the supper fires. Nearby, a chaplain knelt, knelt among the circle of men, praying softly. Some sat alone with their testaments, lips moving silently as they repeated familiar passages. The old commander had been a strong one for religion, and Jackson's influence still lingered in the brigade. Curtis said, I wish you had seen her, Wes. I mean, the way Becca stood up to me. She even threatened to blow off my head. Oh, touching, Wes said. A charming girl. She is, though, beautiful, too. I wish I could get back to town tonight. I have to go again when I can. I forgot to deliver, the, to deliver that letter Jack Skelly gave me for his girl. Tomorrow, Curtis decided. We'll both go tomorrow. My sisters were real happy and surprised to see me, Wes said. We didn't say much about the battle. We just talked about old times, old friends. Curtis was thinking of Becca. It had been a strange day, waiting in the hot sun, wondering, wondering what was going to happen next. Nothing had. They had listened to the rumble in the distance, and reports had come in that there had been a big victory for them out along the ridge. But if that was true, then why was it so important to take Uncle Henry's hill all of a sudden? He had written a letter, trying to scratch out in words the wonder he was feeling. He wanted to be with Becca. He had been afraid to hold her, but she had put her arms around him, and when he had kissed her, she had kissed him back. No starched embroidery or steel hoops between them, just her body warm and soft beneath his, her night clothes. He wished, <laughs> he wished they would hurry up and climb the hill and take it, so he could go back and see her again, kiss her again. Becca, the captain said. Your name is Becca, isn't it? Yes, she came in to the side of the bed, pleased that he was awake. Is there anything you need? Water, please. I'm thirsty. She helped him drink. He looked feverish. His eyes were strange and bright. What day is it? It's Thursday, the 2nd of July. Do you know what's happening out there? Nobody knows very much. The rebels have taken the town and they act as if they're all going, as if it's all going their way. But the battle isn't over yet. It was almost seven o'clock in the evening and the distant thunder that had rumbled out near the round top had finally died away. The weak herd farm was close to there and Becca had been wondering about Tilly Pierce. Now a new disturbance had started up in the direction of Culp's Hill and was growing louder. She could, she had been thinking about Curtis all day. There's no good news then, said the captain. The Snyders have hidden their cow in the parlor, Becca smiled. I'll try and get some milk for you soon. He smiled back. Please don't bother. I know I've been a nuisance to you. I only came here because I'd seen too many field hospitals and I was afraid I'd lose my arm. You were right to come. Dr. Warner took good care of you. Becca, I do have a favor to ask. Would you write a letter for me? Of course I will. Your parents will be worrying about you. My parents are dead. But there is someone, a dear friend of mine. I'm concerned about her. It's been so long since I've had word from her. I'll get some paper and you can tell me what to write. As soon as the post office opens again, I'll mail it for you. Later, as he slept, she read the letter over, curious about the woman who would receive it. My dear Anna, and I am unable to write this letter for myself, but a kind young lady has consented to do it for me. By now, you have heard that a great battle is taking place at Gettysburg, although the outcome has not yet been decided. I am greatly worried, as the rebels have taken possession of the town and boast that they have beaten us. Anna, I am wounded, although not too seriously. It has been some time since I have had any news of you. I hope you are not ill. Please reassure me, if only there were the last... If only this was the last battle of the war, and I could come to you and reassure myself. Your affectionate friend, Adam. She did not think she liked the woman who would not take a few minutes of her time to write to the man who loved her. This must be hell, the stifling inferno, inferno of shrieks and shobs, the evil stench and mindless ranting. Mother, 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 please pray for me. Save me, Lord, save me, save me. Curtis. Curses, thick, guttural, obscene, the reek of sweat and urine, shadowy figures passing, hot fangs of pain, gripped buck sled, a blurred figure swayed above him. Hold on, son, it won't be long. Had he groaned or called for help? Buck, Buck's lips were swollen with thirst. Water? It's gone. You sent for more. Hold on. No hell, then, after all. Worse than that, Buck guessed, a field hospital, probably a barn. He felt the rough straw bunched under him. The floor where he lay was packed with bodies. 
injured men drooping against the walls or squatted, staring dully into space. Some had bloody rags tied around their wounds. Some cupped their faces despairingly in their hands. Voices prayed, babbled, bargained. Winged insects fluttered softly around a smoking lantern. A surgeon with a knife held in his teeth waited as two assistants struggled with a man writhing on a wooden trestle. Finally, as one of the aides administered the chloroform, the man's arms relaxed and flopped limply to his sides. The surgeon pulled a dripping sponge from a bucket, swabbed, took the knife from his mouth, wiped it on his blood-smeared linen apron, and began to cut. Buck felt an inner trembling, but he couldn't look away. There was the ghastly rasp of metal splintering bone. The doctor had a saw now, and his arm was moving back and forth across the makeshift table. Please, no. Buck's mind begged over and over. Please, no. He was shuddering uncontrollably, his teeth set hard against the sound. An object flashed, slapped wetly into a pile of amputated limbs heaped on the floor beneath the trestle. Close to his ear, a voice asked, Danny? Buck turned his head, saw the slack, stubbled face of an older man. His chest was black with blood, and soaked rags were stuffed into the gaping hole. Danny, you'll take care of your mother. Buck knew the man would die. Arms and legs could be treated, but severe wounds to the head and chest and belly were set aside. There was never time to waste on men who weren't going to survive. Will you, Danny? Promise? Yes, Buck said. I will. The man sighed. That cough troubles her. Yes. I'll be home before the baby comes. You tell her that. I will. The man smiled. He seemed to feel no pain. I always could depend on you, son. Buck, with effort, answered. Yes. There was another patient on the table now, held down by the aides. It was a young boy, hysterically crying, gulping his tears like a terrified child. A pungent smell, then silence. Danny? A whisper. Shh. Buck was too tired to talk. I'm here. Just dressed. There was the friction of the metal saw. A man needed two legs for marching. Why, that last day's tramp to Gettysburg had been at least 25 miles. Try hopping that on a wooden peg for snowball fights in the winter camp when the, when the boredom set in and soldiers whooped and played like youngsters in an innocent white warfare. Swimming, he thought of nude bodies ducking, splashing in the water, and a skinny rebel with all his ribs showing, shouting across the glitter of the ramps and honk. Ain't it a caution? You ones look like you weans un without your britches. Courting, he loved Mary Virginia with her shiny braid and vanilla fragrance, but she was older and never would take him serious. Imagine dancing on a wooden leg. What girl would want a crippled lover? His leg was shredded, pain. The surgeon was haggard, but he didn't have a cruel face. Maybe he would cut the agony away and leave the limb intact? Surely he would, if Buck could explain how much he needed it. The Lord, the Lord shall preserve thee from evil. He shall preserve thy soul. But what about his leg? Hands were rising him. He willed himself not to cry out, not to struggle. Please, God, he begged silently. Please, no. Next. All right, chapter 16. The second day of July, slow to ignite, had not burst into flames until late afternoon. Hours later, as a smoky dusk filled the acrid valley, pressed up against the ridges and thickened at the round tops, the day still smoldered fitfully, refusing to burn out. There was occasional dull rumblings and spiteful bursts of firing from the Union left as the damaged army slowly pulled themselves together, waiting for darkness to search for the wounded and hastily covered up some of the dead. But it was the federal right that sparked and crackled now, where rifle fire flared like matches scratched against the fading light. On Cemetery Hill, artillerymen stroked the big guns with a Artillerymen stoked the big guns with a killing fire. On Culp's Hill, a lone brigade watched a fresh attack blaze in from the northwest and wished that Sulcum's men, who had left the entrenchments to help out Sickles hours before, would hurry back. Well, General Stewart, you are here at last. The cavalry commander must have noticed the faint pucker of irony in the words, but Lee was not inclined to scold his officers, and Jeb Stewart did not really expect to be scolded. He was a good man who had made an unfortunate mistake, but he was sorry and had arrived with his usual clink and sheen, plumed hat in hand, to say so. He was not allowed to do much more than that. 
The general heard what Stuart had to say, then nodded and dismissed him. I congratulate you, sir. Stuart got quickly to his feet, his cheerful smile gleaming through the handsome, ruddy beard. I hear you've won a great victory here this afternoon. I wish my information was as quick to arrive as yours. It was a mild rebuke as far as Lee would go. There's no victory yet. The day isn't over, is it? He thought that Stuart left with a shade less jingle than he had when he arrived. He needed to walk, to think. Alone with his hands clasped behind his back, Lee strolled out among the ridge. It was early evening. Soldiers were mulching on whatever was on hand for supper. As their commander passed, they grew silent, and he was touched as always, but the hushed he was touched as always by the hushed respect. A boy boiling cornmeal, his back to the general, saying, Just before the battle, mother, I was drinking Mountain Dew. When I saw the rebels marching to the rear, I quickly flew. He was hushed by a companion. We thought of the men who had fought that afternoon, hundreds dead, many lying with wounds festering in the trampled fields. Tragic, tragic. All of a for a, pulse, all for a partial victory, a bloody patchwork of territory, the broken orchard and the ruined wheat field. Some had made it as far as the ridge and had broken through the Union line, but there hadn't been support and the opportunity had been lost. An incredible effort had been made to capture the little mountain, but that had failed too. Not a good day, not a good day at all. He had hoped to start early and attack both flanks, buckle those people in the middle, but instead of the smoothly coordinated strokes he had planned, the assault had been mainly a series of sporadic punches, and in the long run, they hadn't accomplished much. Maybe Ewell, the new corps commander, had been too timid, had felt Stonewall breathing over his shoulder. Maybe Longstreet, the seasoned one, had limped a bit more than was necessary in following orders. Maybe. Or was it something in himself, not just the bulky heart or the dysentery, but some warning stubble in his brain that meant he was too old for all of this? He hoped not. He was good at it, and he liked to be successful. At times, he wondered how he had come by the, the dark knack for war. Destiny, he guessed, God's will had always guided him, even when he had chosen his loyalty to Virginia over his alliance to the country. He must live to see it through. Something was happening on Cemetery Hill. Flashing movement, streaks of fire, the crash and grumble of artillery. Good. That was good. Perhaps by dark Jubal Early's troops would accomplish what old Pete's had failed to do that afternoon, capture the higher round and roll up the Union line. Nobody noticed him. Most of the men were disabled, some limping two by two, some carried on litters, others using sticks or guns as crutches as they hobbled by. Tully moved stiffly among the shuffling mass, his eyes fixed on some distant point. Fresh milk, fresh milk, a fat-bellied farmer was peddling supplies. How much? Dollar a quart, jeers, catcalls, oaths, Robber, you know what you can do with it? Take it or leave it. Ambulances jostled past, the wounded growing at every bump in the road. Sutters, carts, white canvases, supply wagons, officers on horseback, impatient to push through, gaze stragglers dragging by on foot. Fence rails had been knocked down and set blazing, and the smell of frying pork hung in the air. Shoot me, shoot me, please. A hand caught hold of Tully's ankle, held him. He looked down into the grim, into the grimy face, into the rolling eyes of the man pleading with him from the ditch. I can't stand it no more. Look, he fumbled with his jacket, threw it open, but Tully refused to look at the horror that the soldier wanted him to see. He shook his ankle loose, felt the weak fingers slip away. Both sides of the road were smeared with the wounded. At dawn, these meadows had threatened him with a sinister calm, but their writhing motion terrified him now. All around him, voices were calling out begging for doctors, for food and water and whiskey, for mothers, fathers, wives, and children in a wild babble of misery. Near a hospital tent, Tully watched a musician take off his jacket and tuck it out of sight behind a box of supplies, close to a great heap of amputated limbs. Then, rolling up his shirt sleeves, he ducked inside. Tully moved quickly. Moments later, buttoning on a tight coat trimmed with a lighter blue, he plunged into a field to begin his search. Nobody would question him. Once the band stopped playing, musicians were expected to double as medical aides. It's our, it's our turn now, and here they come. Artilleryman Chauncey Sullivan stood by the brass Napoleon on Cemetery Hill and stared as neat gray columns poured out from Gettysburg into the outer leaf fields, muskets flashing in the stained twilight. 
It's like watching a parade, he said. Those southern boys look almost too pretty to hit. You better stop admiring them and start firing, grinned a veteran close to him, or they'll be parading right over our heads. Confederate guns erupted. Federal cannons exploded in reply, the long-range missiles streaking through the air and bursting one after another among the adva advancing troops. Then Union fire hosed in from the left, and Chauncey saw the perfect lines gape apart, crowds of men dissolving in thick piles of rising smoke. Yet others kept coming on. They reached the base of the hill and charged upward. Our boys are running! Amazed, Chauncey watched the thin line of defense posted along the lower slope suddenly sadder. Oh, those rotten cowards! The 11th is running again! Crews could no longer depress the big guns low enough to sweep the hillside, and orders came to cram in shrapnel, grape, and canister. Fire by peace! Fire at will! The sh fierce shrieks rose higher, drew nearer. Louisiana tigers poured over the banks of a ravine, hurtling a low wall drove upward toward the crest of Cemetery Hill. If they reached the top, the top, Chauncey knew, they could spill down across the Baltimore Pike beyond and wash up behind the federal line. If that happened, the day would flicker out in a humiliating defeat, but not without one last bitter fight. As the enemy soldiers leaped in across the, the redoubts, the gunners met them with revolvers, rammers, hand spikes, stones, and fists. Teeth clenched and faces contorted, whining in fury, the men grappled hand to hand, smashing, wounded, choking, killing. Thrown to the ground, Chauncey Sullivan saw his son streak down forever in a blaze of bayonet. Nearby, a Union battery swung sideways, firing double canisters into the rebel flank at almost point-blank range. Charge! A great bullfrog command from Carroll, whose brigade had just arrived, sent blue bodies surging in upon the gray. In a roar of sound, they were forcing the tigers back down the slope, beating out the wavering screams, sending the, the survivors scattering off into the darkness. It was over. All right, so that's the end of the third section, July 2nd. This is the middle of the battle. Like we said earlier, the battle's gonna go on through July 3rd. Um, so make sure to answer those questions on Google Classroom. Remember, it's one document that we're using for this whole time. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying it. Remember that if you want to come to my office hours, it's Monday through Friday from 9 to 10. And then again from, uh, I think it's either 1 or one to 2 or 2 to 3. So that is where we're at. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying this book. Um, as you know, as I showed you earlier, there's copies in the Google Drive. And yeah, I hope you guys are staying safe, staying quarantined. And I miss teaching you guys. So I hope you're enjoying this. Um, and I'll see you guys later. So yeah.